Our planet is in trouble. Enormous glaciers, one bigger than Mexico, are rapidly melting. The block of ice here is at least 10 times bigger than any of the largest buildings on Earth, including the Pentagon and the giant warehouse NASA built to assemble and store its rockets. As the ice melts and flows into the ocean, the level of the sea rises. Scientists know that global warming is causing the ice to melt. What they don't know, and what worries many, is the possibility that the melting could speed up. There are only a few places on Earth where researchers can find the answer to how fast the ice might melt. The location of one might surprise you. Well, you'll have to be cautious in pretending that our part of the world is the most precious and important part of the world. But in fact, I, I, I think it is. Ironically, for scientists like Jim Bowler, the perfect place to study rising ocean sea levels is the bone-dry savannas of the Australian outback. That's where he discovered a perfectly preserved 40,000-year-old human skeleton called Mungo Man. For scientists, this place is a geological time machine. In, that, in many parts of Australia, you can dig down to the Miocene 20 million years with a spade. It's so shallow. Professor Bowler says that because there are relatively few earthquakes and volcanoes, this is one of the most geologically stable places on the planet. Snapshots of climate change over the eons are fixed permanently in the formations. We don't have the tectonics, we don't have the ice sheets, we don't have the mountain ranges. We have nothing like the tectonic instability of North America, uh, China, Europe, where the coastlines are all wobbling and jockling around. Columbia University geologist Maureen Ramo has come to Australia's remote, dusty plains with three colleagues and some very unusual looking gear. They're searching for clues to the world's future by studying our planet's past. The scientists are interested in an era known as the Pliocene, a time two and a half to four and a half million years ago when the world was warmer, the glaciers smaller, and the oceans higher. So and if we look at the Pliocene, we see a warmer world. We, we, we see uh, vegetation that's indicative of warmer climates. We see forests on the northern coast of Greenland. We see evidence for coral at much uh, more polar latitudes in the tropical regions. One of the things we don't know is how much melting occurred of the ice sheets at high latitudes in this slightly warmer world. Professor Ramo has a plan for filling in this knowledge gap. What we're trying to do is go around the world and look for evidence of past shorelines. The easiest thing to do is Put your back to the modern day ocean, look inland, and look for those fossil coral reefs, or look for those fossil beach dunes. And we did that with supercharged GPS devices, basically satellite monitoring uh, devices that were, you know, order of magnitude more accurate than, for instance, the Garmin you might have in your car. We were very excited. Everywhere we went, we, we, we felt like we were finding what we wanted to find. Ramo and her colleagues drove clear across the desert of Australia's Nullarbor Plain. At Perth, they headed north, logging 8,000 kilometers, or about 5,000 miles in all. Every time they found evidence of an ancient beach from the Pliocene, Ramo measured the precise elevation above today's sea level. Back during the middle of the Pliocene, the planet was two to three degrees centigrade, or three and a half to five degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. But if we continue burning fossil fuels at our current rate, we could be just as warm before the end of the century. And if that happens, we'll have no one to blame but ourselves. When we burn fossil fuels, such as oil and gas, to heat and cool our homes and power our cars and factories, we release billions of tons of heat-trapping carbon dioxide into the air. Sea level is rising. The rate of sea level rise is increasing. And CO2 is increasing. The temperatures are increasing. 
It all makes sense. It makes perfect sense to scientists who understand climate and understand how CO2 acts as a greenhouse gas. Just like a giant greenhouse, the carbon dioxide lets sunlight in, but most of the sun's heat can't escape back into space. Over just the last 130 years, the Earth has warmed by nearly one degree centigrade. That's about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Now that doesn't sound like much, but it's just an average. The Antarctic Peninsula has warmed more than three times the global average, and the Arctic nearly as much. Vast frozen ice caps in these polar regions are melting. A lot of us worry about whether the ice sheets will reach some tipping point where they'll just start, you know, melting, you know, at some dramatic rate that, that becomes almost unstoppable. If even a small fraction of the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica were to melt, it could be catastrophic. Together, the ice in these huge glaciers contains enough water to increase sea level by about 64 meters or 200 feet. Some scientists say sea level might go up by two meters or more than six feet later this century. Large swaths of land would be flooded and submerged. Hundreds of millions of people would be displaced in southern Bangladesh, the Nile Delta, and other densely populated lowlands. The southern tip of Florida, including much of Miami, would disappear from the map. Coastlines are easy to see on maps, but if you're looking for a shore that disappeared three and a half million years ago, you have to know where to search for clues. So this is a rolling kind of lagoon environment. That's exactly what I think it is. You mean the ridge crest? And then I want to go to the other side of this floor of this lagoon. Geologist Paul Hardy of the University of North Carolina has studied fossil seashores around the world. He surveyed Australia's south and western regions for old beaches stranded inland several times before his expedition with Ramo. It takes a bit of instinct and a, a bit of luck to actually locate quarries and deposits that would be uh, now far from the coastline. Each time the team finds a promising site to study, the researchers pile out of their vehicles and try to imagine what it looked like when it was forming millions of years ago. It's just a matter of just walking around and just observing, hitting things with hammers, um, looking under the hand lens. Um, I usually do a bit of a walk, do a transect um, inland, just looking at my feet, what I'm walking on over, taking notes, um, taking measurements. Mudflats and sand dunes turn to stone, are some of the clues to past coastlines they're looking for. That's where they find fossils of marine organisms like corals and mollusks. These ancient relics contain chemical signatures the scientists can read to date the deposits. Team member Michael O'Leary uses a special hollow drill to take samples from corals. And again, it's just, it's just a tool we use to get clean, fresh samples of corals that would otherwise be fairly degraded or altered at the surface, so you want to be able to penetrate into the reef to get the most pristine samples possible. Carefully, the preserved evidence of our planet's past climate are labeled and stored for the long journey back to labs in the United States. It will take many months to analyze and interpret the rocks, but geologist Paul Hardy says even now he's drawn some conclusions from the fieldwork. We're, we're trying to understand how nature behaves under warmer conditions. And uh, what we are seeing from the past is uh, a bit daunting, and that is that uh, warmer climates, warmer than present climates in the past, uh, have uh, produced uh, significantly higher sea levels with uh, contributions of ice to sea level uh, from both Antarctica and from uh, and Greenland. Hardy is anxious to have new proof to back up his belief that polar ice sheets were considerably smaller during the Pliocene when temperatures were only a little higher than today. He knows what's at stake and that time's running out.